And welcome everybody. And I, my name is Benji Cohn with the Minnesota DNR Outreach uh, Section. And we're here today with the 179th, I can't believe we have that many episodes, of the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. And Paul, welcome. You're going to talk to us a little bit about deer management today in research. But first, I wanted to touch on one thing that we have going on. And we, Randall already put a question here about our deer advisory committee. But our advisory groups, we have a lot of them in the DNR. And there's a bunch of them that are open right now from aquatic invasive species to the fisheries work group to the um, Minnesota R3 Council. So if you're interested in helping out and being an advisor for your part of the state of Minnesota to come and talk to us and give us feedback on stuff, please think about joining one of those groups. Um, we'll put a link to those in the chat and you'll be able to click on there and, and join those. So. I think with that, Paul, we can turn it over and talk a little bit about deer management and research in Minnesota and all the new stuff for this year. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Benji. Uh, yeah, my name is Paul Burr. I'm a specialist with the Big Game Program here with the Minnesota DNR. Um, it's a statewide program, and a big part of what we do is managing the state's uh, big game populations, including deer. So I'm going to start my, con my uh, presentation um, talking about deer management. That's going to be kind of one of two overarching topics I'll cover today. Um, <clears throat> I'll be going over some long-term population goals that we establish for deer in Minnesota. I'll also be covering the short-term process of actually setting season bag limits, and then jumping into some uh, 2024 hunting season related items, which as Benji says, is just around the corner, uh, including season dates, kind of an outlook for this year. Um, <clears throat> couple changes that um, are occurring this year and a brief update on chronic wasting disease in Minnesota. And then the second main topic of this talk, I'll be talking about some deer related research that we have throughout the state. Um, we've got a lot of interesting projects for the purposes of this talk. It's going to be very, very brief, just kind of what the project is, why we're doing it, just to really highlight some of the interesting work we have going on. Um, for deer related research. And then at the end, we'll be joined by Grace from the University of Minnesota, who's gonna be talking about um, the awful study that they have going on there. <clears throat> so jumping right into deer management. So we have deer population goals in the state of Minnesota for all the DPAs or deer permit areas that you see there on the right side of your screen, we establish a goal. And basically this goal is just how much of an increase or decrease uh, do we wanna see um, or do we desire in the deer population? Now, about a year ago, we, there was another MOS talk that went into more detail on population goals and <clears throat> season setting. So we'll share that link in the chat. But to kind of sum it up, when we're establishing these goals, we consider a lot of different things. We take a look at a lot of public input, uh, we look at harvest, um, harvest history, biological data, um, winter severity in the area, uh, predator per, uh, populations, as you are probably aware, depending on where you are in Minnesota, the predator community is going to look a lot different. Uh, deer conflicts with landowners is another big issue that we consider, and then also habitat considerations. So what kind of habitat is in the DPA? Is it good habitat? Is there a lot of it? A lot of that's going to dictate you know, what the deer population can really do. So if you're curious about, say, the, the goal for your specific DPA, we have it all listed on our website. Um, here's a screenshot of that website. <clears throat> you can see uh, it's a four-year process that we went through from 2020 to 2023, where we went around the state um, in that four-year time span and set goals um, kind of by those blocks that you see in different colors there on the right. And uh, we just finished uh, last year in 2023. And as an example, let's say you're curious, your DPA is that blue color. Um, those were set in 2020. If you click on and expand that, it'll show you every DPA and the goal. So here we have got a good example of some that are stabilized, some decrease, some increase. And then you see some notes there, you know, related to damage um, on agricultural land, deer densities <clears throat> and whatnot. Um, but we also have a lot more information um, other than just those notes. So we also provide results. Um, 
there's reports there online from any in-person meeting that might have happened where uh, we talked to landowners and, and hunters in those DPAs and they gave their opinion on what they want to see with the deer population. We also do a lot of public surveys. So in this case, an online public survey uh, was given for um, the 2020 uh, DPA uh, goal setting block. And all that information and results are, are right there online. So if you're really curious about how people tended to vote in their area um, or the DPA, you can check those out as well. So these overall goals provide um, a general direction for long-term management. Um, when I say long-term management, we, we do these goals in 10-year chunks. Uh, we do have a five-year check-in to kind of evaluate how we're getting along with our goals. Um, so for example, those blue DPAs there, they were done in 2020. So this winter, we'll be going on their five-year check-in. Um, this check-in isn't a time to reestablish or rework the goals, but really just to kind of evaluate how we're getting along with those goals. This is where we settled for the entire state. So the green um, are goals of increasing, the red are goals of uh, decreasing. In general, in the northern part of the state where some of our deer populations are struggling, uh, we're looking to increase populations up there. In the central part of the state, where it's the transition zone between agriculture and forest region, really great habitat. We tend to have more deer than we might want. So um, overall decrease in that region. And these goals um, ultimately serve as a reference each year for what bag limits we designate. We ask the question, is the, is the DPA, is it above goal, below goal, or is it at goal? That kind of moves us nicely into the annual season setting process. So, Every August, typically at the beginning of August, we <clears throat> release the bag limits and the rules and regs. And if you're wondering how we come up with these bag limits, a lot of things are considered. First is that is that population goal setting. You know, is it is the DPA, do we think it's above, below, or at? That's going to dictate what we do with our season, um, season setting bag limits. We also have a harvest-based population model. So this is a mathematical model that uh, takes in information from the harvest and a variety of other um, uh, factors and basically allows us to model trends. Uh, so is the deer population increasing, decreasing, or generally staying stable? We rely on expert observations from uh, area uh, area staff, both area managers and regional managers. These are, these are folks that are work every day in these DPAs. So they're gonna really have their, their kind of finger on the pulse of what's going on with hunters, landowners, and the deer population. Uh, big game program is also involved and also um, tribal managers when necessary. Public input is a big aspect of this too. Uh, we do have wildlife office hours designated for, for people to come in and talk about issues with wildlife and a big uh, part of that is deer hunting. Um, also consider if there's a lot of calls to area staff, uh, either complaining about too many or not enough deer, we take those into consideration. And we also have an after season survey that hunters um, or anybody from the public can, can take and talk about deer populations. We also look at data related to harvest trends. So are the number of does, bucks, is that increasing, decreasing as far as harvest and also hunter success rate. So as the number of hunters might change year to year over time, uh, looking at that success rate um, on average per hunter really helps us account for that changing um, hunter population. Deer conflict issues is another one uh, that I mentioned before. So landowners, urban areas, farmers, um, are they having a lot of conflict with the local deer herds? Then weather considerations, and I'll touch a little bit more on this in a, a couple slides, but that is a big one that we consider as well um, over time. And ultimately, these are um, approved by the director and the commissioner um, before season bag limits are set. So a lot of time, effort, people are involved um, in setting these bag limits. So here's how we settled for the 2024 deer season. The map there on the right shows the different designations for bag limits in all the DPAs. Um, as a note, the blue DPAs there are the antlerless lottery permit areas. And the deadline for that is tomorrow along with special hunt applications. Um, so if you are you know, planning to hunt in one of those DPAs or a special hunt, just a reminder, uh, the dead, uh, deadline is tomorrow. 
And that table there, of course, shows all the season dates. Archery season is right around the corner, just 10 days away. Um, and then the firearm season begins November 9th this year. Changes this year compared to last year. So we have 129 DPAs in Minnesota. 99 of those are the exact same as they were last year as far as bag limits go. Uh, 30 of them have decreased area uh, DPA bag limits. Um, so of those 30, 19 um, have just a reduction in lottery permits. So just giving out fewer permits, but 11 actually have a reduced total limit. So going from a three deer to a two deer or two deer to a one deer. And here's where those decreases and no change DPAs are located. So the red there shows DPAs that have decreased bag limits. Um, in general, a lot in the north, uh, where again, we're really trying to grow the population, increase it, so we're being a little more restrictive in those areas. I do wanna highlight our deer permit area reports. These are super informative, helpful tools, um, especially for hunting, but just in general about what's going on in these deer permit areas. There's an interactive deer permit area map we have on our website. Very easy to navigate to, and you can just find whatever DPA you're interested in and select it. Um, for example, let's just take DPA 257 here. It shows kind of the boundary of the DPA, where the cities are. It shows you know, certain public lands, and it also has the season dates broken out uh, right there when you click on it. You can go one step further and select DPA details. Uh, and this is where really a lot of the interesting um, and helpful information can be found. So uh, what you'll see there at the top is first the contact info for your local wildlife uh, area manager. So if you want to get a hold of them, um, they have contact info there in a the name. Then there's a paragraph that kind of just in general breaks down um, or describes the DPA, but then goes a little more into detail about um, why the bag limit is the way that it is this year. So in this case, uh, last year, this DPA was a three deer limit. We went down to a two deer limit because the data seems to indicate the population might be slightly below goal. So reducing that by one antlerless deer will hopefully you know, protect and let that population bump up a little bit. Uh, next, um, there on the left bottom, actually there's a report that breaks down private versus public. Uh, the amount of land there is in the DPA, and um, also what kind of public land there is, and then cover type of that land. So is it is there how much row crop, how much forest, how much prairie? Um, and then the next page actually breaks down deer harvest from the past season. Not only you know how many deer were taken, but age and sex of the deer, and also uh, by what weapon type they were taken. And then there at the bottom, it kind of shows you um, the last six years uh, of harvest in that DPA to give you some perspective. So it's a great tool, especially if you're looking at maybe reaching out to different DPAs as a, as a starting point um, to get an idea of what's going on in that hunting area. And then there at the bottom right, what I highlighted with that red box, it's kind of small, my apologies, but there is a printed um, print PDF version of this. So if you select that, it just condenses all that information into a nice one page uh, PDF that you can print um, and look at different DPAs. So again, really helpful uh, tool for hunters, um, especially uh, looking at certain DPAs. So moving to the season outlook, um, this graph here on the left shows harvest of deer over a hundred years in Minnesota. Um, the last two, three years, we have seen a reduction in harvest overall. And, but if you compare it to the last 20 or 30 years, it's really, um, you know, really not that out of the norm for what we've been seeing here in Minnesota. Harvest is gonna fluctuate for a number of reasons, you know, how many hunters there are, quality and quantity of, of certain deer habitats always changing, hunting conditions. You know, if we have a really rainy opening season, um, opening weekend, that influences how many how many deer we harvest, you know. And bag limits are always changing. Predator communities are different, um, and then winter severity is uh, is a big one as well. And that map there on the right just shows a percent change in harvest from 2022 to 2023. Um, so the red there indicates you know reduction in total harvest. Um, again, no, north northeast is is really where we're seeing kind of um, the reduction in harvest the last couple of years, unfortunately. But the good news, we had a very, very mild winter. 
That map there on the right shows winter severity index. And basically the darker the color, the worse the, worse the winter was. And there's really no color on there. Um, very, very mild winter. Um, winter severity index, we had a um, pretty recent webinar on that as well, looking at deer and their adaptations to winter and how winter influences survival. But uh, just to kind of sum it up in general, winter severity index or WSI is based on temperature and snow depth. The colder it is and the more snow there is, we know it's gonna influence survival of deer and fawn production. It's gonna have an impact on how much winter forage is available and when, when spring green up happens. Uh, big impact on predator avoidance. You know, it's a lot harder to run from predators if you're going through a couple feet of snow. And it stresses deer out by increasing um, the amount that they have to tend to travel. You know, if, if it's a bad winter, they seek out high quality deer habitat in the winter or deer yards. And they've been known to travel, you know, tens of hundreds of miles sometimes. So although we had a really mild winter, um, I do wanna point out the previous two winters were overall um, pretty severe, especially in certain areas. Um, we set some records for temperature and, and snow depths in certain areas. So it's great that we had a mild winter as kind of a reprieve from that. But I do wanna note that just because we had a mild winter doesn't mean we're gonna see uh, an immediate bounce back of deer population. Really, we're staying conservative in general with bag limits to allow that population to cover, to, to bounce back. Um, and it's gonna take some time to see that. And hopefully we'll have another mild winter or more mild winter. Um, and it's gonna do nothing but help the deer. Uh, but again, it's, it's gonna take some time. I'm hopeful this year that obviously with a mild winter, the deer are gonna come out of winter, just overall better body shape, better condition, um, better survival. So what that looks like in the long run, we'll just have to kind of wait and see. We've also had some questions about what about the, the especially wet spring we had. Um, you know, the previous two, three springs and summers, we've been in drought conditions. This year it was very, very wet. Um, overall, more rain is gonna promote vegetation growth, which is gonna be uh, an increase in forage production. So overall, it's, it could be a good thing, um, but there could uh, be very localized negative impacts. You know, fawns, um, fawns are very susceptible uh, to hypothermia. So if they're born at the wrong time and you know it storms for four days in a row, uh, hypothermia um, is a very real possibility. And, it's, and also flooding. If, if uh, the rain is so bad they're causing flooding events, that's gonna impact fawns as well. Uh, but again, localized. It's gonna depend on where they are and just the timing of, of rain events and flooding events. But overall, it's a good thing as far as forage production. So what's new for this deer season? Um, not a lot has changed as far as legislatively goes or rules and regs go, um, but one big change is there is now an exception to the carcass movement restriction. So just reading that first bullet point, um, servant heads with or without cape and neck can now be brought into the state if they're brought to a taxidermist within 48 hours. So beforehand, you, you couldn't bring basically um, any cervid parts into the into the state of Minnesota that contain any kind of brain tissue or spinal tissue. Um, now the change is where if you you know harvest a trophy outside the state, want to get it mounted in Minnesota, you're now allowed to bring just that head with a little bit of neck um, and, and the cape uh, to a taxidermist in the state within 48 hours. So a little more um, freedom for, for hunters that go out of the state um, and then helps out the taxidermists here in the state as well. The same line of thinking, if you're hunting within Minnesota in a CWD management zone, um, you can now take, again, only that head with or without the cape um, out of the zone to a taxidermist within 20, or 48 hours. Um, and the reason why we can do this is now waste disposal at taxidermist is now regulated um, and it must be done by an approved method. Camp Ripley hunt. This was a, a new kind of a bigger change this year. So traditionally, um, Camp Ripley is a military base near Brainerd, Minnesota. Um, it's had in the past a special three day archery hunt. It was classified as a special hunt, but now moving forward, um, Camp Ripley, any hunting in Camp Ripley will be completely um, 
uh, run and overseen by the, the camp itself. Uh, this year, they're going to have the entire archery season open, but there's going to be a limit on the number of people that can hunt per day. Uh, if you want more information, again, it's all based on Camp Ripley. Um, there's that link uh, to ripley.isportsman. Isportsman is, is an app they use to manage it. Um, so if you've traditionally hunted there or you're, you're thinking about hunting there, make sure you look um, at that website because it's completely run by them now. No change to the shotgun or rifle zone boundary. This seems to be something that's come up every year, uh, but unfortunately it did not pass. This is in statute and the legislature um, has to pass on this and it, it just didn't pass again this year. And then coming up as kind of a teaser for next year, spring of 2025, we hope to introduce a new electronic licensing system. So this is gonna be an online based and mobile application. Uh, where people can purchase their license and permits right there on their phone um, and also register their game. So still very much in development, but uh, look forward to that in the spring of 2025, hopefully be tur before turkey season. And then a brief update on chronic wasting disease or CWD. Um, first thing to note is as far as feeding and attractant bans, we added the county of Aiken County. They're pointed out by that green arrow. Uh, because there were a couple additional CWD positive deer found near Grand, uh, Grand Rapids, Minnesota. So if you're in these counties, um, just be aware that feeding deer and using attractants to attract deer is illegal. Mandatory sampling this year um, will be occurring during the uh, opening weekend of Firearms A season. So that's November 9th and 10th. So any deer harvested in a management zone which is those shown in yellow or a surveillance zone, those shown in gray have to be um, sampled uh, if they're harvested during those two days, ninth and the 10th, and only if the deer is one year or older. We have a variety of ways people can get sam their deer sampled. If you're within the management or surveillance zones, you can go to a staff station or a self-service station. And then outside of those zones, we have a bunch of other options as well, partner sampling programs, which um, are taxidermists or, or sports shops that have agreed to take samples for the DNR. Um, you can also call your local DNR office or you can request a mail-in sampling kit. Here's a screenshot of our main CWD uh, page. And if you go here, we actually have a CWD interactive map by that link right there. If you click on it, it actually brings you to a web page of the entire state of Minnesota. You can zoom in, scroll around, and it shows you a variety of options that you have for getting your deer sampled and also dumpster locations. So I encourage you to use this tool, um, especially if you're hunting in a management or surveillance zone. As an example, I work in the Rochester office. So this is the Southeast. You can click on um, these, these icons and it'll bring up, you know, what dates certain things will be available um, and also phone numbers to get a hold of your local uh, area office. And here's what this uh, mail-in sampling kit looks like. If you're curious, um, it's a really easy process. You just go to that link, you, you, you enter your name, your address, and our wildlife health program will get you a test kit sent uh, very, very quickly. Couple uh, last minute updates for CWD. Um, again, just a reminder, we have carcass movement restrictions in management zones. So that those thick red lines around the management zone basically indicate you cannot move a carcass out of those uh, zones unless you have a negative CWD test, or if you, you can debone um, and just leave any part of the spine and head in that zone. Um, again, the, the, the new exception is if you're taking a head and part of the neck out um, to a taxidermist within 48 hours. DPA 642 has been created this year. It was previously 342, but a positive deer was harvested near the city of Wabasha, so that is now a management zone. And finally, that green circle there in the, in the Northeast, um, we've added some surveillance uh, zones in that area as part of an elk restoration project. So if you're curious why um, sampling is mandatory there, it's because of that project. So that was a quick um, update on deer management. I'm now gonna switch gears to deer research. Again, I'm gonna briefly be covering a number of, of topics that a lot of um, 
you know, staff and researchers are involved in. Um, and this is just kind of highlight a few. I'm not an expert on all these, but I, I got a general idea of what's going on. So I just wanted to share some a select few of what's what we're doing. First, looking at monitoring deer populations, as you might expect, estimating the number of deer in an area is going to be super important when we're managing deer. However, it can be very, very, very challenging. Um, Aerial surveys have been a big uh, tool in the past, but they're difficult to do. They're expensive, they're dangerous, and they require snow. Um, in recent years, we've been kind of lacking snow. So as part of this, Minnesota DNR is testing two different methods to estimate deer populations, asking the questions, are they feasible, are they accurate, and are they cost effective? The first one is happening in northern Minnesota. It's a camera trap project. Uh, the idea here is to randomly place trail cameras out on the landscape in a predefined area, photograph deer, and then that data is modeled uh, to estimate deer numbers. And they also use artificial intelligence to actually detect deer in the pictures um, with pretty good success. So um, right now it's still kind of early, and this is uh, the first year of a larger three-year project. Um, so we'll, we're excited to see what results show, but overall confidence in the estimates that have been uh, produced seem promising, um, but work is ongoing. The second project dealing with uh, deer population monitoring is a roadside distance sampling. And this is occurring in Southern Minnesota. That map there shows four DPAs on the South boundary of the state. Um, here, these distance sampling um, procedures involve just driving predetermined routes, which are shown by those blue and red lines um, in that image, and recording deer using spotlight or thermal cameras. And you can see some examples of thermal uh, camera pictures of deer there in the middle. Um, and overall, uh, this study was completed recently, but um, analyzing it and writing it up is still in the works. But from preliminary uh, data does show that the estimates that were coming up with this technique um, are comparable to what we get with aerial surveys as well. So just showing promise that it could be an alternative to aerial surveys. We also have um, log your deer and wildlife sighting. So it's, a, it's an observation study that allows all hunters. So if you're a hunter out there recording, I encourage you to go to this website and you get to log your observations of what you're seeing while you're hunting. Um, and this is one way hunters can, can be an active part in monitoring the deer population. And we do use this data to a certain extent when we look at trends over time. This next study, um, the fawn study in Southern Minnesota, this. Uh, one of the researchers on this study, Tyler, actually gave um, its own moss talk uh, last year on this project, but I wanted to just kind of highlight it again in case you missed that. Um, really, all these studies could have their own moss talk, but just covering them all briefly. Um, in this case, the, the point of this study was to use drones and thermal cameras to find and locate fawns and then put little collars on them. When they have that information and collar fawns, they can look at um, fawn survival and what's uh, affecting it. They can look at what's causing fawns um, mortality or to die. And they can also look at how fawns move on the landscape as they get older. So here's some um, images of the work being done. Um, you can see the drone there. And then on the right uh, is showing the path that they fly. So it's just kind of a zigzag pattern, searching a predefined area and looking for fawns. And this is what a fawn looks like um, on that thermal camera, just a bright little football shape. And then you can switch to the normal camera and actually see the fawn there in the grass. Another interesting um, and cool example of the mom, the doe with its fawn there tailing behind. So this study is still ongoing. I'm just sharing um, some preliminary results from just the first two years. So in 2021, they colored 75 fawns, 22, 82 fawns. Um, that three month survival, so the probability of a fawn surviving to three months was 77% in 2021, dropped down quite a bit um, in 2022 to 54%. And that's kind of what we're seeing too more recently is um, in the 50s, uh, but again, all preliminary, we're still working on it, but really um, valuable information that, you know, we don't know what's going on with fawn survival and recruitment. And this study is really getting at that. 
And there for the first two years on um, that table at the bottom shows mortality. So by far and away, coyote depredation um, is the biggest cause of mortality of the fawn there in, in southern Minnesota at least. All right, next project is looking at winter survival and habitat use of deer in northern Minnesota. So that image shows two study sites, kind of north central and northeast Minnesota. Um, an area that we're really lacking up to date information on some of these vital rates, so survival um, and habitat use. So this is going to be a very interesting project. Um, or we're looking forward to getting the results out of this project when it's finished. Basically, um, using collared, collared deer, they're looking at the habitat selection and composition. So where are these deer hanging out, especially in the winter, and what are they hanging out in? Um, and then looking at survival rates and how that relates to that habitat that they're actually occupying. Also looking at how survival changes um, between the two study sites and different winter conditions and also deer density. So there's a lot of deer in the area. How is that going to impact survival or vice versa? And also when um, these deer do die and a mortality signal is sent to their sent to the researchers, they get out there as fast as they can to try to determine cost specific mortality. Um, this, the field work for this project is done, but we're still kind of waiting on wrapping everything up um, due to some staffing issues, but we're excited to see uh, what the results show for this study. <clears throat> this is kind of what they're trying to get at, right? So on the left is cover type of the study area and it's showing, you know, is it, is it dense pine? Is it, is it a mix? Is it hardwood? Is it, is it wetland? Um, all those different colors are different cover types. And then on the right, is deer home ranges for deer that they had in 2020. You can see the home ranges really vary in size substantially. Some are really small, some are quite large, and they're all gonna occupy kind of different cover types. So this is what they're getting at, looking at how, how different cover types might influence survival. We've got a few things to cover related to CWD research. Um, as we talked about before with uh, mandatory sampling, um, we do a lot of CWD monitoring in the state. A lot of time and effort goes into this program to monitor CWD. Uh, this last year, over 14,000 samples were tested. Uh, and you can see the breakdown of different samples and positives there in that table, which is also a screenshot from our website. Some of these um, samples indicated by the blue arrows come from agency cold deer. So we do localized culling, so very, very fine scale um, culling efforts. If we have CWD positive deer in an area, we go to that local area and we try to reduce deer numbers. Um, it's a management tool a lot of other states used. Um, in this project, this research project, in collaboration with a number of universities, is actually looking at the effectiveness of localized culling as a management tool. So that'll be, um, again, really interesting uh, results. Uh, that are directly related to management. And then we're also um, collaborating or at least helping or assisting the University of Minnesota, Mississippi State University um, on a CWD prion uh, deer scrape site. So prions are the causative agent for CWD um, and they're testing the soil and the licking branch marked there by the red arrows of deer scrapes to determine if they cannot, if they can find um, uh, presence of those prions in the soil and on the licking branch, um, you know, deer, especially during mating season, um, will create these scr uh, scrapes. Um, typically, rub their their glands, urinate, um, you know, lick the licking branch. So a lot of different uh, fluids are are being um, deposited there, and many many deer are, are are visiting. So this is one monitoring tool that they're testing to see if it's an effective way to find CWD or at least prions in an area. Um, the method they're using is still kind of um, new and upcoming. It's not uh, a, uh, USDA approved yet, but they're hopeful that it will get approved in the future. And the last study I wanted to touch on, it's called the Southeast Deer Movement Study. Um, this, uh, this research project actually concluded a few years ago now, but I, I wanted to highlight it still for the purposes of this talk because it's really an interesting um, study that has informed some CWD management. So the idea here is to study how deer move across southeast Minnesota, which is where um, most of our CWD is located, 
And this is gonna help us better inform how we manage CWD. So that image there is not the best, but it kind of shows the Southeast corner, um, what used to be DPA 603, and all those points are, are different locations of uh, deer. 225 deer were called for this study using helicopters. And then from these caller deer, they were able to get all sorts of useful information. Um, <clears throat> the first being that about 26% or about a quarter of does actually move away from where they're born. Uh, on the flip side, bucks, 43% actually move away from their birthplace, which really isn't surprising. We know in general, males tend to kind of wander out more, especially as they get older. And then of the does that did move from their birthplace, they moved about an average of 12 miles and bucks about 14 miles. And um, this is where it's really informed some management looking at these distances traveled. And you can see the map there that shows um, some examples of some longer movements as well. As far as mortalities in this, um, in this study, uh, a big takeaway here is hunter harvest was the largest cause of mortality. Um, you know, as we manage CWD, we want to keep hunters as the number one management tool. Uh, and this really shows that as far as controlling population, um, hunter harvest is still the number one way that we're doing that. So um, we'll continue to do that as long as we can. And that's all I had for summing up uh, the research I wanted to. Again, not an exhaustive list, but a short list. Um, now we'll have Grace from the University of Minnesota come on and talk a little bit about the study they've got going on. Yeah, thank you. So, hi everyone. My name is Grace Malinowski. I am the coordinator of the Awful Wildlife Watching Project with the University of Minnesota Extension. Um, this is a research and participatory science project. We're funded by the Minnesota Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund. And I'd like to tell you more about what we're studying and also invite you to join us. Um, so in case awful is an unfamiliar word to some folks, and it is to a lot of folks, um, it refers to the internal organs of a butchered animal. So we are studying hunter provided gut piles and the scavengers that eat them. Um, the purpose of our research is really basic. We're just trying to understand what and when species use hunter provided gut piles. Um, and we do that by asking hunters to set up trail cameras on the guts that they leave behind. And then um, that captures images of all the wildlife that is visiting and eating those gut piles. Um, so how we do this is we are looking for deer hunter participants to join our research. Um, we're looking for hunters all throughout the state of Minnesota who can commit to setting up trail cameras on the gut piles that they leave behind immediately after they field dress their deer. Um, leave the camera up for one complete month. And we know that gut piles usually are gone and eaten before then, but um, the one month mark allows us to standardize our research. Um, and then retrieve the camera and then send us all the photos that you have collected. Um, we have complete camera setups to loan out to hunters, um, and that includes a Browning trail camera, a case, a lock, um, and all the, the memory cards and the batteries included. And we can cover the mailing both ways to get that um, to hunters to use. And then you are also welcome to use your own camera if you have one. Um, we just have protocols about what sort of settings we'd like you to use, um, and you can send us the images the same way from your own cameras. Um, so we'll ask you to fill out some brief online data forms throughout the project, and um, and then we can see all the scavengers that ate your guts. Um, I'd like to note that we are not studying um, ammunition. We're not studying CWD. We won't ask about what type of ammunition you use. Um, and we, we do ask you where you're hunting, but we don't disclose that information in any public way. Um, so volunteers, if you if you'd like to join us, you you will probably need some sort of basic tech experience. Um, we want you to record the GPS coordinates of your camera um, and have some internet uh, connectivity to submit those online forms. And then we share the images back and forth through Google Drive. So that experience is helpful, but not not exactly necessary to join us. Um, and then in exchange, you 
we'll share with you all of our project results and the analysis that we're doing. We can provide tech support throughout your participation and you get to see directly um, how your gut pile was used by wildlife. Um, you're also contributing to important research that clarifies the impact of this human provided food source for scavengers every year. And um, that data could help answer a lot of important questions for wildlife management management agencies about things like animal animal behavior and disease and contaminant exposure. Um, so the other part of this research is that we ask volunteers to help us identify and classify all the wildlife caught in those um, photos that we've collected. And we are up to having hundreds of thousands of photos to analyze. So there's no way that um, we could do it as just our small team. So the way that we do that is we post all the photos on an online platform called Zooniverse. And then um, you can log in from anywhere in the world and help us um, identify what is in those photos and what the animals are doing and if they are eating the guts or not, things like that. Um, and then I will just leave you that, again, we would welcome your participation. Um, if you'd like to register as a hunter to join us, that's on our website, which is um, just awful, O-F-F-A-L, Dot umn dot edu. And um, thank you to everyone for letting me join this webinar today. And uh, we hope to see your awful photos this year. Thanks. Thanks, Grace. Yeah, thanks to both of you for joining us today and sharing all the great Minnesota stuff. And Grace for joining us for that. So I just went to the next slide. I just wanted to kind of highlight the big, big game program team. Um, all this there, Barb Keller is our, our fearless leader. And then Todd's the coordinator. Myself and AJ are both specialists. And then Kelsey Lashar is a uh, recently new elk coordinator. So if you would like to get a hold of us, we do have a big game specific email there. I'll leave that on for a few seconds um, or whenever Benji tells me to, to exit out of it. Yeah, everybody write that down if you want to email us or send us a note to our Moss email too, and we can get that connected to you. So uh, yeah, thanks both of you for, for doing that. Um, it's always great information hearing about all the research projects that are going on and all the fantastic work you guys do out there in the field to keep our deer population where it is and, and provide opportunities for the hunters that are out there. So uh, let's get to a couple of questions. So if you guys have any questions for for Paul or or Grace, um, please enter them in the Q and A there, and we'll get to those if we have time. So, uh, Jesse was wondering on your um, DPA map that you showed, Paul, why does the metro area not have a deer management plan yet? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, should have touched on that, but it's it's so heavily urbanized, right? Millions of people live there. Um, in general, it's there's just too many deer. Um, and so we don't have a goal of increasing, decreasing, or staying the same. We're always pretty liberal with um, our harvest designations, uh, just because of the fact that it's in the metro area and a lot, a lot of deer there, a lot of deer. Yeah, there's, I know there's some good city hunts around the metro area, but it's really hard to get a good count on all that stuff, I suppose, too. So, um, John was asking when you showed the historical harvest graph, why were there so many years that appeared to have zero harvest? Um, so early on, believe it or not, there were quite a few years where, you know, there weren't deer weren't doing very good in Minnesota. Um, a lot of people don't realize just how much of a recovered species they are, you know, especially the last 20, 30 years growing up, you think, oh, there's always been a ton of deer, but um, there's been, you know, especially going back 80, 90 years, uh, all those zeros are during times when Minnesota just didn't have that great of deer population or they were wiped out, um, you know, priests or during settlement, they were over hunted, there wasn't rules and regulations. And then by the time we started establishing those, we said, oh, you know, there's not many deer, we better close the season. So a lot of those um, in the past. It really speaks to the North American model of wildlife conservation and you know, the Dingle Johnson Act and Pittman and Robert Act that, you know, are using 
excise dollars on hunting and sporting equipment to help fund some of this con conservation we have. And um, you know, the United States has done a pretty good job recovering a lot of species and providing opportunities to get out there and hunt and fish. So thanks everybody for buying your fishing and hunting licenses for sure. So. Um, you did mention a, a change in the shotgun and rifle zone boundary, or not a change, but John was wondering what the proposed changes were for that boundary. Sure, excellent question. Um, the proposed change would just to be eliminate the shotgun only zone. So it would be um, the entire state would be rifle. You're allowed to use a rifle. Um, right now, I don't have a map of it, I'm sorry, but in general, kind of the northern half of the state is uh, rifle zone. And the southern half, more in the agricultural area, in the south, southwest, and southeast, is is shotgun only. Um, and so we've been, or not we, but it's been brought up um, to the legislator for multiple years now to just eliminate the shotgun zone, uh, to allow people to use rifles. Um, but there, there are some concerns from certain certain municipalities or or counties that um, are worried about safety. Um, but we have seen from other states like Wisconsin that have eliminated their shotgun zone um, that it tends not to be an issue as far as number of instances, uh, firearm instances don't increase. Um, but overall, it is viewed as a, a safety concern from um, from people. So that's usually what's been stopping uh, that statute from changing. So legislative thing, and they I know they bring it up seems like every couple of years, but mm. uh, Dorothy had a question about the fawn research. How long do you leave the collars on the fawns? Do you, I don't know if you know that answer or if it's a Tyler question. <laughs> it is a Tyler question, but I, I do have an idea on that. So the collars are designed in such a way that once enough pressure, like as the deer get big enough, it's just designed to kind of pop off. Um, same if, if if they get hung up on a fence on accident, um, it's designed to just to kind of break off, and I think they're they're shooting for about a year. So it's designed so that by the time the the fawn is about a year old, the neck is a certain size, and the the collar will will snap off. Cool. Amber, hi Amber, one of our learn to hunt mentors in the past. Any current research on deer transport of ticks and tick-borne Ill illnesses? Not to my knowledge, not in Minnesota. Um, I'm definitely not an expert in all things research, uh, at least not anything recent. Um, we do have some other members of, of the Big Game program here as panelists. If they know of anything that I don't know of, I'll, I'll let them speak of it, but I'm unfamiliar with any tick-borne specific research on deer. Interesting. You know, is there tick-borne research on, on moose Coming up, I know we're doing a moose talk later in the fall, but yeah, so we have a moose project coming up, and I don't know how involved ticks are going to be in that. I, I believe it's more um, looking at well, survival is going to be a part of it, so I'm sure ticks could come up. Uh, I'm sure that'll be part of it because they can be a pretty pretty big bother for for moose, but it's not like tick specific. It's just I'm sure it'll be part of it. Joe, just wondering how many people attended this webinar. We don't know yet. So I, have, <laughs> I saw over a hundred um, in the count, but it always changes a little bit. It is recorded. So if you guys want to find your recording, visit us at mndnr.gov slash discover, and you'll be able to find a recording of this webinar as well as the 178 of them before there. So um, visit us there and see the recording if you need. Uh, Jeff had a question regarding the CWD testing. What are some tips on how to identify if your deer harvested is less than one year old? Excellent question. Um, and we do have online resources, how to age deer, um, but you're basically looking at their lower jaw and how many teeth are there. So they have three tricuspids and no, three premolars and three molars. Um, well, an adult does, so three and three. Uh, deer that are one year, or less are gonna have only two front teeth. Um, and that's that's how you tell just real quickly, you cut open, you, you pick, uh, pull away a little bit of the skin and you count the number of teeth. And we have that information on our website as well with pictures and a walkthrough. Um, once you do it a couple of times, it's pretty easy. Great. Craig was just showing us some jaw bones earlier. So that was kind of, kind of fun. Timely. It is, yeah. 
it's one of those things if you don't i haven't done that for years but if you don't look at them you kind of forget how to do it so those we, online uh, resources are great yeah and at the staff staff um station if you do bring your deer there we'll you'll see us do that we'll make a slit and, and count and there's always kids that come up and go what are you doing and you, you point to the teeth and you count and they 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 get a real kick out of that um, but if you do uh like a do-it-yourself mail-in kit that also has step-by-step -step instructions not only how to collect the lymph nodes yourself but also how to age the deer because that is something we do ask when you when you send it in is the age and the sex of the deer great uh, Jeff had another question for Grace. Uh, what are some surprising, what are the most surprising findings so far from the OFL study? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So last year was year five of data collection. And I was surprised that even after five years, we added 10 new species to the list of awful visitors. Um, so it just goes to show that there's a lot that we still have to learn about awful, but um, Another cool thing that we discovered and published a paper about was something that one of our hunter participants pointed out that they noticed on their photos um, was that barred owls and bobcats were being observed, um, not only scavenging at gut piles, but also hunting. So they are smart enough to know that a gut pile is going to attract rodents. Um, and we aren't sure if, they, if the bobcats and the owls were attracted first to scavenge the guts and then they found out that they can get a fresh meal at the same time or if they know that rodents are going to be there and they can they can use them as use them as opportunistic hunting grounds too so that was a new behavior that we published a paper about that you can find on our website and read um, and then another thing is that we i think i am surprised by the species that show up um, i'm surprised that we get a lot of fishers considering that their populations are declining, but I think they have showed up on more than half of our gut pile, um, our gut piles monitored. Um, we have some surprises like deer eating deer guts and um, rabbits, you know, animals that we consider sort of exclusive herbivores are sometimes opportunistic carnivores too. So um, those are always uh, interesting and surprising things to see. Great. It always, it's always cool seeing your website and some of the animals that you guys find on what on the uh, gut piles. So that's always fun. Um, Julie had one question I missed. Thanks, Cassie, for sending that to me. Um, again, we're talking about Minneapolis suburbs and the deer populations. I don't know if any of you have any tips on how people can get answers, but Julie says here in Eden Prairie, we had a huge increase in the deer population. They're very damaging to yards and veg vegetations. Um, they ended up installing a fence around their house. It didn't solve their problem, but not everybody else's. So what are some suggestions for people that live in metro areas? I know some cities have specific hunts to eliminate some deer. Sometimes they do in-city archery um, hunts. I know of some cities that have called in, I guess, sharpshooters to help eliminate some deer. Um, any suggestions for people that live in the metro area that have deer issues and how they might approach city council or where they would go to find some answers on that yeah so that's just it they have to go to their city council their municipality and bring it up to them because if it's in uh the boundaries of the city um even though it's within a dpa where we say yeah it's a five deer limit the city itself is going to have certain ordinances on, on what can and cannot be done as far as hunting goes so it's kind of out our out of our hands unfortunately we do work with many cities that will come to us and say, hey, we have a deer problem. What do you suggest? Um, and there are some groups in the in the metro area. Uh, I think it's Metro Archers um, groups that do a lot of running a lot of those archery hunts and they work directly with the city uh, government and establishing seasons and rules and regs. Um, so that is the best way is to just bring up these concerns to either the, the city, and, um, uh, the commissioners of the county or or the parks board um, to to basically complain and, and say we have a deer problem and there, yep, there are gonna... sorry ben you go ahead i said that was going to be my guess too so good answer <laughs> there are a certain number of like at home or or products out there that have 
some success, but I've heard overall it's deer are just, they're pretty resilient. You can buy plant specific or species specific plants that deer aren't supposed to like. They're sprays, but they wash off. Um, and then of course you can build a fence, but there's also ordinances um, with that in mind too. Some cities don't allow you to build a fence high enough. So, or put out an electric fence that might be against uh, the local rules. <laughs> um, so it's all very city specific, unfortunately. Yeah, so reach out to your municipality and um, see what they can do and see what they suggest. Um, it's the best advice we can give. So John had a follow-up question to my, to well, our answer, I think. How do you sign up to be a sharpshooter? I'm not for sure how you go about doing that, but there's, I know there's a group out there. I don't know, I'm sure it's a company that people hire to do that. So you'd have to probably Google that one, John, and find out, so. Typically we use um, the USDA wildlife services. They are, uh, they're professionals at it, they're trained at it. They do our agency culling for CWD work. And I think cities that do use sharpshooting tend to use them as well, but I won't speak for, for every city. Yeah, but usually it's camera, contracted so. with USDA wildlife services. Um, there's one other company um, that does some kind of regional or na national stuff that's uh, called white buffalo um there's there it's actually there's not a whole lot of companies that conduct it uh usually the municipalities use their own police department um or wildlife services so uh that would be your best bet john is uh look at uh wildlife services and or um the municipality in particular so great well thank you everybody for joining us today um looks like we had a great weekend coming up here again a nice fall weekend in minnesota so thank you for joining us hope everybody has a safe and adventurous weekend outside uh, join us next week we're going to talk about exploring minnesota's wildlife and aquatic management areas in our 180th episode so hope to see everybody back next week have a fun and safe weekend out there enjoy the great outdoors and bring somebody with you thanks everybody